Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started while my internet is up and functioning. Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. We're sure glad you've chosen to worship with us today. Yes, Sally, absolutely. Seize the moment. This is a sacred time as we gather in community to open our hearts to God. I invite you to light a candle as our candles are lit here in our sanctuary to remind us of God's presence with us and to set aside this as a time of worship for you. Our service will be in voice and text. Music will be on the media viewer, so be sure that you have media turned on. There will be a link in nearby chat if you want to view the video in your own browser. I'm going to start our gathering music and run the rest of the announcements underneath. Good Caiaphas, the council waits for you. The Pharisees and priests are here for you. Ah, uh, gentlemen, you know why we are here. We've not much time and quite a problem here. Howling mob of blockheads in the street. A trick or two with lepers, and the whole town's on its feet. He is dangerous. Superstar. He is dangerous. The man is in town right now to whip up some support. A rabble-rousing mission that I think we must abort. He is dangerous. Superstar. He is dangerous. Look, Caiaphas, they're right outside our yard. Quick, Caiaphas, go call the Roman guard. No, wait! We need a more permanent solution to our problem. What then to do about Jesus of Nazareth? Miracle, wonder man, hero of fools. No riots, no armies, no fighting, no slogans. Infantile sermons, the multitude rules. We dare not leave him to his own devices, his Half-witted fans will get out of control. But how do we stop him? His glamour increases by leaps every minute. He's top of the pole. I see bad things arising. The crowd crown him king, which the Romans would ban. I see blood and destruction are elimination because of one man. Blood and destruction because of one man. Because, because, because of one man. Our elimination because of one man. Because, because, because of one, cause of one, cause of one man. What then to do about this Jesus mania? How do we deal with the carpenter king? But where do we start with a man who is bigger than John was when John did his baptism thing? Fools! You have no perception! The stakes we are gambling are frighteningly high. We must crush him completely! So like John before him, this Jesus must die For the sake of the nation, this Jesus must die Must, must die, die, must die, die, this Jesus must die So like John before him, this Jesus must die Must, must die, die, must die, this Jesus must, Jesus must, Jesus must die
The lectionary gospel reading for this second Sunday in Lent comes from the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John, and is unique to John's gospel. Although the lectionary places this story here at the beginning of Lent, the story actually takes place while Jesus is in Jerusalem during the Passover, and soon after he threw the money changers out of the temple. I played that first song from Jesus Christ Superstar to give you a sense of where this story falls in the gospel. Jesus has a nighttime visit from a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, the tribunal of the temple in Jerusalem. And it is from this story that the well-known phrase born again comes. But the Greek word anothen can be translated three different ways, as being born again, as being born from above, or as being born, born anew. And the problem with translation is that each translator must pick one. The new Revised Standard Version updated edition, which we will hear today, uses from above. But as you listen, remember that the words carry all three meanings as well. And today, a new is speaking more to me. Also, the notes to this most recent scholarly edition indicates that there is good evidence that the quotation of Jesus's words ends at verse 15. So the rest traditionally attributed to Jesus himself would be the words of John, the evangelist, the author of the fourth gospel. So today, because I want to focus on the words Jesus speaks in this story, we'll stop at verse 15. Although the lectionary takes the passage through verse 17. Let's listen to God speaking to the words of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Something was going on with Nicodemus. Something powerful. A man like him, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, a religious teacher and leader, secure in his power and position, in his role in society, he wouldn't risk all that. Opening himself up to ridicule at best by being seen with Jesus, just because of idle curiosity. And given what he would probably have heard from his fellow Pharisees in the temple hierarchy about what they would do about Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, who was a credible threat to their system. The risk to Nicodemus from this visit was significant, which is why he had to come at night. He would be judged by the company he kept, and for him this would be strange company indeed. But there he was, an old teacher of Israel who came to be taught. We've been looking at the model of the compassion practice as described by Dr. Frank Rogers in Compassion and Practice, The Way of Jesus. So I'd like to consider this story through that lens, to take its pulse, if you will. Pulse stands for the elements that are the beating heart of the compassion practice. Paying attention. Noticing behavior, emotions, body language. Understanding, using empathy to reflect on what we notice. Loving connection, holding the gaze of compassion. Sensing the sacred in that moment and embodying new life for that situation. How might we use our spiritual imaginations to consider the story of Nicodemus through the lens of compassion? I wonder what Jesus was doing that night when Nicodemus came. Was he sitting around the fire teaching? Was he taking some time to pray? Was it late enough that he was asleep? And Nicodemus woke him up. Whatever Jesus was doing, Nicodemus interrupted it. And the words Nicodemus spoke sound anxious to me, almost as if he was afraid to say or ask his questions outright. Rabbi, he says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. And Jesus listened and heard all the things Nicodemus didn't say. Like, who are you that you can do these things? And what does it mean when you tell me about the kingdom of God? Jesus listened and he paid attention. I wonder what he noticed. Jesus might have recognized the strong emotions that brought this man to him. He must have seen that something was activated in Nicodemus, something that moved him to seek out Jesus. Maybe he saw Jesus turn over the money changers' tables that very morning and felt Jesus' righteous anger and was afraid. Not afraid as the high priests and other Pharisees were afraid. Afraid for the systems or institutions Jesus challenged. Or afraid of the danger if Jesus challenged the Roman occupiers. But instead afraid that Jesus was a sign. A sign that while he and other religious leaders 
had perpetuated systems and institutions in God's name. They had really gone down the wrong path, had strayed farther and farther from God, afraid that God was with Jesus and not with him and his colleagues in the temple. And that if it is true that, as they say, you are known by the company you keep, that he's been keeping the wrong company. I would note here that some of the yous in this scripture are plural in Greek. So when Jesus says, you do not rec receive our testimony, he means more than just Nicodemus. He's saying that the group to which Nicodemus belongs aren't listening to what God is saying through Jesus. Maybe Nicodemus was afraid because he was an old man the end of his days drawing near, and was anxious about how his life would be judged in the last. Or maybe he saw Jesus and his followers come into Jerusalem singing, Hosanna, full of this fire of the Spirit. And he remembered the first time he came to the temple as a youth, full of the spiritual fervor that would lead him to become a religious leader. And he longed to feel such passion again. But that fire had long since gone out, leaving an empty space inside him where once it had burned brightly. And he ached with that loss. Or maybe he just sensed a new calling, new possibilities, something that seemed just out of reach but called to him. Whatever it was, Jesus understood because he treated Nicodemus and his questions seriously. He tried hard to help Nicodemus understand, to move out of old patterns of thinking, old patterns of behavior, old patterns of living. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born anew. Born anew, Jesus says, echoing perhaps the words of Second Isaiah. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? He wants to help Nicodemus see the possibilities for a spiritual rebirth available to us at any age. But even in the face of Nicodemus' confusion, Jesus keeps on reminding him of what he already knows about the power of the Spirit and the strength, the strength of the wind, the breath of God that can make all things new, promising him that it's not too late for him. Jesus' response has just enough challenge to get through to Nicodemus. But there's also words of encouragement, words of hope. And when Jesus says, still, you don't remember these, you don't understand these things, I hear a patient teacher or parent saying things like, come on, you can do this. And I imagine Jesus gazing at Nicodemus with compassion. And if Jesus had such patience and compassion for Nicodemus's questions, we can know that he has such patience and grace with our questions and our doubts. Because God's compassion, his compassionate love, can hold them all. We don't know what happened then. But I like to imagine that in this nighttime conversation, a connection was formed between Jesus and Nicodemus, the wandering rabbi and the Pharisee. That it became a moment, a time out of time, sacred moments in the dark where God entered in. The wind of the Spirit 
gently blowing the candle flame, making it flicker and dance, rekindling perhaps the flame within Nicodemus's heart, birthing him anew so that he could carry that flame out into the night to embody new life. Because this is what compassion does. Frank Rogers tells us the story of Azim Kamisa, whose 20-year-old son Tariq was killed by two gang members while he was delivering a pizza. The gunman was Tony Hicks, who was given the gun by a gang leader and told to shoot. Tony shot Tariq once through the heart, and Tariq was found dead at the scene. Tony, a 14-year-old African-American boy raised in poverty in a broken home in a society and system filled with racism, was tried as an adult, convicted, and thrown away in a prison cell. In the months that followed, bereaved Father Azim struggled with his rage and despair. He struggled with the desire for vengeance. But he also prayed, prayed with the teachings of his religion, Islam, that one should not be consumed by hatred and to find a way to forgive even the unforgivable. Gradually, he found peace and a greater connection to the divine that could hold him and his family, including his murdered son, Tariq. His heart opened to compassion, and it was then that he went to visit Tony Heather in prison. When he looked into the eyes of his son's murderer. What Azim saw wasn't a killer, but a terrified child beaten down by a world stacked against him. As Azim described it, he gazed straight into Tony's soul and saw the boy's humanity. In that moment of connection, both hearts were touched by a sacred grace. Tony glimpses not only that this large-hearted man is holding him with healing care, but also that this man's heart beats with the sacred love of the universe that holds and heals as well. For a moment, Azim and Tony are held together by this divine presence that sustains them both. Azim today still works with young people in communities ravaged by gun and gang violence. And he also worked for Tony's release from prison, testifying at his parole hearing. Tony was paroled in 2019 and today works for Azim's foundation, writing letters and speaking to marginalized youth. He has earned advanced degrees and advocates for alternatives to violence. Through compassion, they were both born anew. I wasn't there the night a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a member of the institution that would participate in his death, went to see Jesus. But whatever happened, it broke Nicodemus open and forever changed him. We know this because the Gospel of John mentions him twice before, after, twice more after this. When the chief priests and Pharisees of the Sanhedrin ask why the temple guards did not arrest Jesus, Nicodemus, a member of that august body, speaks up in defense of Jesus, saying that the law does not condemn someone without giving them an opportunity to be heard. And then, after Jesus' crucifixion, Nicodemus helps Joseph of Arimathea prepare Jesus' body with care and lay him in the tomb. The man who came to Jesus by night full of fear, not wanting to be seen in his company, left as someone new, 
someone who would speak up for Jesus before his peers and superiors, and who would tenderly care for Jesus after death. He started keeping different company. So whatever happened, I imagine it must have been something sacred, something holy, something powerful. Each time we look at another with the gaze of compassion, there is a crack in our world, and the holy leaks in, and we can sense the sacred. It doesn't have to be life or death. Such moments can happen all the time. Maybe we meet the eyes of a frazzled mother with small children in the grocery store checkout line, and we smile. And even if it's just for a moment something happens, something sacred, something holy, something powerful, and in a small way, we are born in him. Amen. Worship is a time when we as a community join our hearts together to connect to God and to each other. So this time is the essence of what we do here together. If you have a prayer, 
of joy or concern that you wish to lift to God and have supported, supported by the energy of those gathered here. Type it in the nearby chat at this time. And as people share their prayers in text, please read them prayerfully and hold this space as sacred and safe to open our hearts to God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jamie, prayers for the transgender youth of Texas and Tennessee, and for the transgender and non-binary people of Tennessee. Amen. Amen. Surround that whole situation with prayer. It's so heartbreaking and angering, and it needs all of our compassion to surround that situation. Maybe it can be resolved in a different way. O oh God of grace, hear our prayers of support and compassion for all the transgender folks in Texas, Tennessee, and other places where they are under threat. O oh God of grace, hear that prayer. We joyous prayer for the people of Ukraine and all in places of war. We pray for peace wherever there is violence. God of grace, hear that prayer. For Cleo, because Cleo needs something, and we don't need to know what that is, but God knows. So we hold Cleo in our gaze of compassion. We hold Cleo in love. And God of grace, hear that prayer. With Lili thanking God that our depression seems to be lifting, lifting. Amen. That's so good to hear, Lili. And hoping that Lord wills that it stays gone. We offer that prayer of gratitude that Lili is feeling better. And we ask that that continue. For God of grace, hear our prayers. It's clear for all people who feel lost and abandoned. And prayers for good health for all sick people. We lift up those prayers for God who knows the lost hearts of all who feel lost and abandoned, and who surrounds them with that gaze of compassion. And they feel it, feel the comforting presence of God, and prayers for all, for good health for all who are sick. And God of healing, hear that prayer. Really, thank you, Lord, for the guidance I received regarding my group plan, and I still ask for some guidance about Relay. We ask for that prayer of discernment to be lifted up by all. We surround that with prayers for wisdom in this time. God of grace, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers, those voiced here today, those spoken only in the depths of our hearts, and those for which we have no words. We lift them all to you, O Lord, with faith in your boundless love and grace. Amen.
yes, I want to trust in my heart of hearts that your love, your love is here. So I will sing, your love is here and it's greater than our doubts. Your love is greater than our fears. Yes, I will sing, your love is here and it sees our broken hearts and somehow Yes, I want to trust in my heart of hearts that your love, your love is here. Oh, I want to rest in your strong arms. Yes, I want to trust in my heart of hearts that your love, your love is here. So I will sing, your love is here. be strong we don't have to be sure we don't have to be right we don't have to see any blinding lights we don't have to be strong we don't have to be sure we don't have to be right we don't have to see any blinding lights we don't have to be strong we don't have to be sure we don't have to be right we don't have to see any blinding lights. We can just be. So we will sing. Your love is here and it's greater than our doubts. Your love is greater than our fears. Yes, we will sing. Your love is here and it sees our broken hearts. And somehow we can hear your love is here. We, we just ripped up our, 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 our grandma's pantry and the food pantry to sacristy and IV pole, grocery bag and takeout, looking for what sustains us. God sustains us with the gifts of earth and sky, with parable words to guide our decisions and human helpers to hold our sorrows. God does not sleep through our prayers or slumber when we weep or complain. God is our host, giving us a true meal for the hungers of daytime work, the wanderings of the night, and even when danger and loss surprises us. We have bread and cup, strength when we go out, bread and cup, comfort when we come in, a sacrament of life as real as daily food, as holy as the small, sweet gift of Holy Communion. 
In Lent, we remember that Jesus suggested new birth to an old teacher, drank from the bucket of a lonely woman, denied any connection of disability with pity or shame, wept for a friend and opened a grave. We remember that Jesus turned over tables in the temple and confessed that some church tables, practices, plans, and programs should be overturned until our house be one of prayer and our table serve compassion to those most vulnerable. And we remember that at this table, when Jesus Christ, sitting among those whose feet he washed clean for a Passover feast, of precious ancient tradition and participating betrayal and desertion, pain and death, made a new covenant of blessed bread and poured wine that has become a global table, inviting us to share both our brokenness and grace. Let us pray. O oh God, you so loved the world that you sent your beloved one, Jesus, into our midst. Jesus, also loving the world and seeing how hungry we are for hope and love and peace, set this table to sustain and save us in the midst of all things. Grateful for all who have told us this story and shared food and Holy Spirit with us, we ask. May the bread of our mouths and the cup upon which our hearts meditate be acceptable to you, O God, at this ordinary table and in all places and ways we feed one another. Amen. Let us receive the gift of God, the bread of heaven. We come to Christ in this and every bread we share. Let us receive the gift of God, the cup of blessing. We come to Christ in this and every cup we share. In thanksgiving for this sustenance on our Lenten journey, we claim all stories of Jesus Christ as our own. The God of healing and love toward the cross and the ever-present truth of the resurrection. Let us pray. O Holy One, we come to you with our weariness and hope. We thank you for the rest and strength of this communion so that we may return our tables to service in the world and hear your words of guidance every day and every night, leading us to be born anew. Amen. Amen. Our worship is over. Our ministry to the world is just beginning. The world is waiting. Go in peace. Come again in hope. Amen. We shall be known by the company we keep by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we've thrived, it is time we leave 
feed ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds a change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love.